Today I want to talk about not just getting older, but the fact that our gut represents a really important part of our ageing, and that by looking after our gut, we can actually alter how we age, whether we age well or whether we age very, very badly. And if you're at that stage where you've got problems, then guess what? Working on your gut can help you. I'll show you this as we go through. And this is not new. In fact, it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, there are some quotes from 2000, uh, uh, over 2,000 years ago. But we also know that even primates, when they get certain gut issues, they can go <coughs> and seek out certain plants. And then when the scientists went and looked at the plants, they had certain ingredients that were specific for those conditions. So pretty smart, aren't they? Mm -hmm. We've just forgotten that. Because we used to follow this procedure when I was a kid, and I noticed some of you are older than me. When I was a kid, my doctor would actually say, um, have you been to the toilet? What did it look like? What did it smell like? All those things first. That was one of the first parts of the interview. And this was 60 some years ago when I would be you know, asked about those things. Now it's, um, okay, quick, and you get, oh, out you go. And the difference is very, very much because you don't get to hear what's going on. The gut is, has been, up until the 1930s, the major part of looking after our health and well-being until the pharmaceutical companies took over, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You see, I have a very strong bias. By the way, I love our doctors, I love our GPs. Many GPs say exactly what I do, but they're not allowed to say it loud. For the very simple reason, they're under strict control by the pharmaceutical companies and the government run by pharmaceutical Coming back, I'm science-based. And it's really simple, because what we do know is that the single biggest cause of health conditions that we have now are related to the gut. And this is my quote. And you're going to say, but hold on, what about COVID? Well, COVID actually goes through the gut. What about Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's goes through the gut. That's if you remember it. Um, <laughs> just oh. testing if you're awake already, okay? Oh. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So we've got all these conditions. Everything goes through the gut. I'll, I'll demonstrate that to you as we go along. Here we go. And even gut illnesses, and the first part, people come up and they say, Peter, I've got all these gut illnesses, which is often a forerunner to certain illnesses. And you look at that list and you go, wow, what's that list? Gerd, nerd, dirt, erd. Then you've got SIBO, SIFO, SIDO, all those, you know, acronym, you name it, there's an acronym for it. And you go, hold on, I know reflux. And I know all some of these other conditions in there, but the critical thing I'm trying to show you here is that these are the list of the conditions and all of these conditions are on the rise. All of them. In fact, when we go down to the bottom, you'll see that stomach and colon cancer on the rise by about 300% over the last 20 to 30 years. And then you go a little bit further, Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer, 500%. Uh, wow! And everyone says, why? And they go, oh, geez, I don't know. Let me tell you why. It's called 21st century lifestyle. And unless we alter it, it's going to keep on this trajectory up there. Now, what's great about the age group here is you remember what it was like 40, 50, 60, 70, even, even maybe touch on 80 years ago. So, so the, answer, the answer here is we need to look back there to actually work out what we're going to do in the future. And all these conditions are actually um, a new manifestation of our diet and lifestyle and our environment. And it's really simple. At the beginning or at the core of all these illnesses that we talk about as we age, there's something called inflammation. And inflammation was down. I remember a, an article on Time magazine, front page, inflammation, the end of all cancers, because cancers rely on inflammation to actually you know, develop and spread around the body. Uh, the end of heart attacks and stroke, because that's what causes it. So you will take some anti-inflammatory drugs and things like that to block them. So inflammation is the cornerstone of all illness. Now, we know inflammation because you get a cut and you get a red mark and that's inflammation there. But what we've got is this chronic low-level inflammation in our body that's slowly wearing us down. And we often don't notice it. it just, you know, first it might be just a bit of fatigue or a little bit of soreness in a particular place. Or you, it takes a while to get over a, a wound or an illness or something like that. And you go, oh yeah, okay, that's aging. No, no, that's the gut. That's inflammation aging. And I'll show you this in a moment. And so these are all the conditions that are linked with inflammation and you can see all of them it doesn't matter i can put up many many more yeah, if you want and then we go back and, and have a look at the the conditions that are, are linked with gut specifically 
and I can't find an illness that's not linked with the gut. Now, it might be 5% or 95%. It might be 5% or 95%. But when somebody comes up to me, and remember, I'm not a medical doctor, someone comes up to me and says, hold on, um, you know, I've got, uh, I've got uh, wrinkles, what do I do? I say, fix the gut. How's that? Pretty simple, easy. How do I do that? Well, I tell them, go to my YouTube. I've got all my stuff on YouTube for free. Now, if you don't go on YouTube, get someone who can, and then go on YouTube, it's all free. So, I'm constantly, someone comes up and says, oh, I've got uh, a Parkinson's, is there anything I do? Yes, there is something you can do, fix the gut. Is it gonna reverse it? It actually can reverse quite a few of the symptoms and maybe delay the process. Oh, what? Alzheimer's, yes! That's what the studies show. They don't have a vested interest in making up stuff. I have a vested interest in getting the science out there. Now, I'm not allowed to say that, uh, I go on some social medias and they'll block me because there's a there's a medical uh, pharmaceutical war going up there. But the studies show very, very clearly um, heart attack and stroke. Can you minimise it? Oh, some people say, oh, yeah, but we can actually make a big difference out there. And these are all the diseases. But it's not just women due to these. There's also lots of other conditions out there. And, you know, the, these other ones right through from the things that really matter to us. Loss of hearing, loss of, loss of sight. Little things, you know, sarcopenia, loss of muscle and then frailty and so on, right through to healing and wounds. You know, you get a cut and it's sort of taking three days to heal it and it takes a month. Um, that's all indicative of inflammaging. And so what we're going to do is work out how to do that. And the single biggest source of inflammation in the body is the gut. 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 I'm going to say that once more. Mm -hmm. I need support. The single biggest source of inflammation is the gut. gut. So if somebody comes to see me, uh, with a condition, what do I say? Fix the gut. How simple is that? Is it going to get rid of everything? No, it's not. Is it going to help with everything? Yes, it is. Five or ninety-five percent. And I say, why not do it this way? Because that—that that is the way that our, our grandparents and our, our parents and so on used to do. And some people will turn around to me and say, but it's genetic. Oh, genetic schmetic. Let me tell you, hereditary accounts for this much of the chronic conditions. This much. I just re finished reviewing a thousand studies on hypertension, a large part to do with gut health, and I guarantee you will not find anyone else out there talking about hypertension in the gut. But I can find a thousand studies just on that one topic if I wanted to. But I reviewed all these studies, and they were very, very clear. The hereditary factor, the genetic factor, in hypertension is 5.7%. Wow. So the other 94.3% is what? Well, epigenetics. It's beyond your diet, your lifestyle, and most much of it going through the gut. So you're looking at these mice saying, what are these mice doing up here? Very, very simply, they are the most famous mice outside of Mickey and Minnie Mouse in Disneyland. Why? Because about 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, they did an experiment. And these two mice are genetically identical. Now look at one of them. One of them's nice and fluffy. It also is on the way to a heart attack, stroke, diabetes. It's got the equivalent of dermatitis, if you can see its skin, and all those other conditions are there. And it will die 30% younger than the nice skinny road big one that you see on a farm or your backyard somewhere. What's the difference? Well. That one got some B vitamins and a few extra nutrients, and the big fluffy one that's gonna die early also got exposed to a fungicide. What the experiment was showing was that nutrients can make a big difference and the toxins can make a big difference. Wow. Now since then, there have been thousands of these studies, not just on these, but on, on rats and <coughs> dogs and cats and, and monkeys and, and even humans. They now look at humans because we've got the time frame of looking at it and they say it show exactly the same. So it's not genetic, it's what you do. The only disease that runs in the genes all the time is diarrhea. <laughs> That's a bad dad joke, isn't it? <laughs> Red dad joke now, but yeah, yeah, you get the idea. So the message is simple. We have to take responsibility for <coughs> it. Well, the critical thing here is that, um, and this is unique to what I try and teach people, is it all goes through the gut. And from the gut, most people are talking about the large intestine around here. What I'm talking about is your whole digestive system, from the mouth to the bottom. And why I say that is because 
if you've got any, you know, let's look at plumbing in your house or electrics, if you've got a problem at the beginning of the house, you got a problem through the rest of the house, correct? Mm -hmm. So, the same happens. If you've got a problem not digesting in the stomach, guess what? You've got problems with the rest of the digestive system. So trying to fix the end bit on its own without fixing the top and the middle <coughs> and all the bits in between is pretty well um, a waste of your effort. It could work, but we'd be smarter about it. And the most critical part about your digestive system is it works on pH. Now all of you have heard of um, pH now. Mm -hmm. Acid, alkaline. Acid, zero, one. Alkaline, 14. Alkaline, 12, 14 is your Drano and that type of stuff. You don't get on your skin for obvious reasons. And strong acid is one which is called hydrochloric acid and your stomach produces it. And your stomach produces that hydrochloric acid for a really important reason. But first, in your mouth, your saliva produces bicarbonate. So your pH of your mouth is about seven, not acid. And it starts to break down all of the um, uh, sugars and things in our diet because the enzymes work at seven, a pH of seven. I didn't understand the importance of pH when I was first taught <coughs> in year 10. And it's keep, just keep coming back to me thinking, wow, every chemical reaction works on its own unique pH level. So if you're trying to do something and the pH is out, it won't work. So in your mouth, it's supposed to be selling. If you've got an acid mouth, and I'm not talking about the kid who swears at you, mm -hmm. but if you've got an acid mouth, you have tooth decay. And the acid is indirectly coming from the soft drink, but it's actually coming from your saliva. Your saliva, if you don't have what's called a bicarbonate store to produce an as a saliva of seven, then you will have tooth decay. Simplest way, is to make sure you get your pH in balance. Mouth, alkaline, esophagus, alkaline, stomach, acid. Your, your stomach releases hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid opens up the proteins and the enzymes break down the proteins, which work in a pH of two, in an acid environment. Wow. So it's all, this is amazing. It's almost designed as though it works together. It's called the human body. It's a symphony of it. A total orchestra of, and, of, of things happening at the same time. And if you don't get the pH in the stomach right, then it stops working from there and down and even up. So what we want to do is make sure it's acid. Now, of course, if you've got reflux, you've been to the, uh, if you've been to a, 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 a GP who hasn't kept up with research, they'll say, ooh, you've got too much acid. I'll put you on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. Sorry, Nexium. And they'll put you on that which lowers your pH in your stomach, which says, oh no, I can't digest proteins. Which, by the way, then makes them go through to the large intestine. And you know what proteins smell like when they ferment? Rotting fish. So what's going on here? We want an acid stomach. The research is very clear. 50 to 70% of people with acid reflux have too, sorry, not enough acid. And I won't go into the reasons why, but age is an issue there. So 50 to 70, and the other 30 or so percent have enough, but not too much. I've never come across a person with too much acid in the stomach. So doing these drugs works great for financially the drug companies, it doesn't solve the issue. So what do we do? Well, what we're gonna do is get our stomach back to being acid. Then when it goes into the small intestine, it becomes alkaline. And when it becomes alkaline, the enzymes work. The bile, which is by the way, alkaline as well. Um, everything's alkaline and it stops the bacteria growing and it stops the hydrochloric acid burning your small intestine. Wow. Then it goes into your large intestine over this side and it becomes acid again, releasing what's called short chain fatty acids. Three of them called acetate, you'd probably know what it's vinegar, propionate, and the miracle one is butyrate. You know the highest concentration of butyrate in our diet is butter. Please don't eat margarine. Please. And I don't get sponsored by the butter industry. Okay. Do not eat plant-based oily things that they call butter or margarines. Coming back to it. That's just a little hint along the way. So it changes because it has a different function at every single level. And what we want to do is make sure that that functioning, that pH, not being able to digest. And the single biggest problem we have with Gut, uh, uh, gut issues in the stomach is the over-processed 
big meals. We have the equivalent of three Christmas meals a day, every single day. Morning, maybe even four or five for some people. Early in the morning, late at night, and our digestive system is exhausted, run down and tired. You've been told that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It is if you're a farmer about to go out and work in the farm for the next three or four hours. And it is if you're a school kid because they won't give you morning tea. But at the end of the day, it's gone. I don't eat breakfast. Today I ate breakfast because I had something in my belly to come here because I'm doing a couple of these talks, you know, about three or four hours of activity and so on. But I normally don't. I have my breakfast at around about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Why? Because it gives my digestive system a rest. I don't eat, oh, by the way, I don't eat cereals either. I don't eat cornflakes and that. That's why I'm writing a book called Cereal Killers. <laughs> I'll catch up with my joke sooner or later. <laughs> At the end of it though, we overeat. So what did I have for a snack this morning? I had some vegetables and a couple of mixes of nuts and pepitas. Wow. Yeah. How simple is it? We're the only culture in the world that has cereals for breakfast and we're the sickest in the world. That's not the only reason. Go to the long-lived populations in the world. The ones in Okinawa or on the top of the Himalayas or the top of some mountain somewhere. And they actually eat fruit, nuts, veggies, herbs, spices every single meal. We don't. We don't. And yes, they have meat. And they have all these other things and we don't. And they live to 105. They've got the super centenarians now, even beyond 110. Wow. And by the way, they don't supplement. What? See all these new things coming up about supplementing so you can live to a... Supplementing is great, but remember, people are trying to sell you a product. Just remember that one. At the end of the day, get back to basics. This is the basics we should be teaching people. What the super centenarians do. And it's eating that style of stuff. Whereas you have a, a meal like this, a big processed Western meal, that oh, I'm only treating myself three times a day, four times a day. I love it. I used to do a lot of seniors programs. For the last 10 years we've been touring around the country. The COVID stopped that, so we retired. But, and I used to go to do all these seniors talks in, in WA. And by the way, has anyone ever been to any of my talks? No? A couple of people. Oh, and you've come back. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, if you do have a camera, feel free to photograph any of it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy if you, but please don't record it for obvious reasons. I record it and put it up on my YouTube. So the message is very simple. You have a meal like this, and it really is poisoning your system. It's exhausting it. Forget the fact that it's sugar and it's got the wrong type of foods in there. It's over just extending, and your gut doesn't have a chance to actually. Food should be in there, digested and out. We should have two or three small meals a day between about 11 and 6, and that's about it. We don't need the late night ones, we don't need the early morning ones, unless you're about to do something very physically active and so on. So it's simple. I won't aim to ask, answer questions because at the end I will. And for the very simple reason, if I start uh, taking questions, you won't get home tonight. <laughs> so please bear with me here. So the message is these big meals, put it in the stomach, and guess what's going to happen if you have enough of those? It's called reflux. It's really simple. Um, but I only have a small meal now, but did you have this stuff? Yeah. It'll call reflux. And I'm not just talking about this, I'm just talking about overeating. Keep the meal small, keep them simple. And at this stage of our lives, most of us have learned this, by the way, haven't we? Already. To trial and error. Then you have another condition called SIBO. So it goes into the small intestine after the stomach. And sodium bicarbonate is released. Not Mackenzie's, your brand. And it releases it and it alkalizes it. And the enzymes can do their work and they can start breaking it all down. And if they don't, then bacteria grow. Small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And if they grow and ferment, they produce gases. And the gases can't come up here as a, excuse me, as a burp. And they can't go down there as a, whoops, a fart. Should I say flatulence? <laughs> they can't go down there as a fart, it's too far down, so where does it go? Now these people have a biscuit and they're walking around with a gut rock hard, no muscles, rock hard because the gases are pushing on all the intestines and everyone says, oh I get this bloating 30 minutes after a meal and already there's a few people going hmm. maybe two hours after a meal and it's a bacteria or the fungi, the wrong microorganisms 
in the spot. And so what happens? Well, it's because it's not bicarbonate, it's not alkaline. So they can grow, these microorganisms love an acid environment, and then they can recreate the acid environment so more of them grow. They did a really simple experiment in 2008. They injected some sodium bicarb into the small intestine of mice who had SIBO. Within one second, everything started working again. Now, am I suggesting an injection? <coughs> no. I've got easier things to do. But that's how simple it is. And what they all people go, oh, how hard it is. And these people suffer all their lives. And that's why I, I basically I'm continually putting my stuff up on the social media to get it out to as many people as possible. So we don't want to see. Then we've got our large intestine. Now, this is the, the large intestine, which is what most people consider when they talk about the microbiome. The microbiome is the 100 trillion microorganisms in the large part from here up across and down and then at the bottom. And those are the ones when 95% of the time when people are talking about the microbiome or the microbiota or the gut, that's what they're referring to. And these microorganisms have lots, so many functions, uh, digestion and metabolism, they're, they produce chemicals that go around the body and they're anti-cancer and anti-heart attack or they've got ones that are inflammatory. Your gut is the most commonly single biggest source of inflammation in the body. And um, there was a Russian scientist, um, I call him Ivan, I've forgotten his surname. And Ivan in 1907 identified that there were chemicals coming from the bacteria that they'd only just discovered Prior to then, bacteria didn't exist, you see. They just, just joking. They, they discovered the bacteria and they, there was a chemical going into the blood and he said that that's what was causing ageing. All the ageing related diseases. Inflammaging. Now that went, went on for another 20 or 30 years until the pharmaceutical companies took over. So he knew back then, as did Hippocrates, that if we can lower the problems coming out of here, we can lower all of the problems around there and maybe then start to treat the real cause. So what we've got is viruses, bacteria, archaea, protozoa, fungi, all in our gut. And the beautiful thing is they're supposed to be in balance. And what we're after, and what I'm going to show you today, is how to create that ideal balance. And the scenario is, when we're born, we're actually born with a gut microbiome. 20 years ago they thought the only place for a microbiome was the skin and the and the, the gut, if you other places, now it's everywhere, everywhere. You've got a kidney microbiome, a biliary microbiome, a urethra microbiome, you've, you name it, you've got an oral microbiome, you have a hair microbiome, <laughs> you have hair, um, all these micro, but inside your body as well as outside. So when they're born, an infant is born, they already have a microbiome. And then they get the best gut food in the world called <coughs> mother's milk. A mother's milk has a, about a half a dozen ingredients in it, listen to this, that is not designed for the child. It's not. It's designed for the bacteria in the gut. What? It's got something in it called lactoferrin. And lactoferrin poisons the nasty bacteria and keeps the good ones alive. It's got a whole group of what's called oligosaccharides that feed bifidobacteria. And you've all heard of bifidobacteria? Mm -hmm. Read the yogurt containers. Mm -hmm. and, you know, acidophilus, bifido, or, or lactobacillus and, and bifido. They're the ones commonly in there, which is great. And so all of a sudden we've got breast milk, human milk, which is designed. And all these ingredients, they're not designed for the child. They're designed for the bacteria to produce stuff for the child. Wow. And so I'm the first six months or a year or something, it goes, it, it develops the immune system and develops all of the networks that are needed for that infant. And then they start to go on solids and the solids, the introduced duction of different foods. A, B, C, the 26 letters of the alphabet were the foods. And the more they introduce, the more different types of microorganisms they get, up to about three. So it goes from here to here to here at three. Four, five, whatever age, it doesn't matter. But it goes up. And then it gets to, well, in the papers it's just saying 65, but, and it kind of goes in. But I actually think it's probably going to be about 30 nowadays. Because I see so many young people who are coming up with all these diseases of old age. 
at, at 30, at 30, at my talks. And so it collapses. Now, on the contrary, if you're a centenarian, it goes up to 100. If you're a super centenarian, it goes up a bit higher. And then it collapses. Now, maybe it'll be, you know, um, up in biodiverse through 120 in a few decades time. But the message is this, it's the biodiversity of the gut to some degree is a major predictor of how long you're going to live. And to a degree, you can also, and in five years time they will have this, that they can take a sample of your microbiome and it'll say, you've got pre-diabetes, you've got pre-hypertension, you've got uh, uh, pre-Alzheimer's. They'll be able to say that via the microbiome. They already know specific bacteria. The problem is everybody's microbiome is different. And what they're looking for is unique clusters of these, what you would call opportunistic species that cause arthritis. Yes, arthritis. Or cause hypertension. Or cause Parkinson. You know Parkinson's disease was identified as a gut-related illness um, about 100 years ago when they first discovered it? Because of the links with constipation, before they even knew about the gut microbiome. So the message is, we'll be able to, they'll be able to predict that Literally, and what they find, and this is an example of one bacteria that you must remember the name of, Bifidobacteria. And with Bifidobacteria, they find it goes up, then adulthood it stays, and then it declines with age. So you look at that little graph there, you see it going down here with age, and that's when you've got heart care necessary, you know, all those other things. So what's that going to say to you? I want more Bifidobacteria, correct? No. You get the idea? Now how do you get Bifidobacteria? I'll show you, it's not just probiotics. Certain things can feed it. So coming back, if you understand that, then you'll understand certain things that you can do that can make a big difference. Then we've got the gut. Why do we need to constantly work on the gut? Because there are so many factors out there that can alter it. First of all, as we age, we tend to eat differently and narrow our eating. So we eat like that and then we eat like that. And the if you want a, a, a microbiome that's diverse, I, I like calling it a rainforest. If you want a rainforest in your gut, then you're gonna eat a rainforest worth of foods. Every possible size, shape, color, you name it. The more, the greater the diversity, the greater the diversity of your microbiome. Have you got that one? So if you're eating, uh, hold on, yeah, but I have uh, wholemeal bread in the morning, uh, white bread at night, and uh, cereal and pasta at dinner. Guess what you're eating? Grain, grain, grain. Um, I have oh, maybe half a slice of grain a day. That's it, max. What do I eat? I told you for brekkie. I had some veggies and some nuts and seeds. Wow. And then I've got some veggies wrapped up in a little um, uh, rice paper roll to eat with a, a little bit of fruit. So every one of my meals is different and every one of my meals is feeding my microbiome to make it a rainforest. The more, and this is great for your grandkids and kids when they say, oh, I don't like that. Learn to like it. Some people say, oh, I don't like turmeric. Bad luck. You know, that's how I'm, I'm sorry. Try it, taste it. When it comes to my health, I will eat it. And that's what I've got to get across to people. We need the biggest range of these biodiverse nutrients in our diet. Mm -hmm. Then we've got toxins in our water, medical system, antibiotics are, deadly on the gut, and you know that 50% of antibiotics in the scientific studies say they shouldn't be used. And because people are sicker, they need more antibiotics, and vice versa. And there's a condition, by the way, it's a classic one, called LPR, laryngeopharyngeal reflux, silent reflux. I got it eight years ago, so I worked out how to fix it. And that silent reflux was, <coughs> have you heard that one before? <laughs> Runny nose, constant ear infections, tonsillitis every month, Sounds like your grandkids, does it? Or great grandkids, something like that? Yeah, well guess what it is? It's silent reflux. That's all it is. Antibiotics make it worse. You have to treat it short term, antibiotics make it worse. Why? You've got to treat the reflux first. Which fortunately, I have on my YouTube as well. I'm not trying to sell you something because it's free. And I'm putting all my materials up there. LPR, and I hear it all the time. Then we've got um, uh, sugar, gluten, over processed foods. All of them are overprocessed. Then you've got opportunistic species like Helicobacter and Candida. Candida is also called thrush. Weight gain, sleep, poor sleep, stress, uh, lack of exercise, all of those affect the gut microbiome. 
So whatever you know is good for you is good for your gut. Or I should say it's good for your gut, so it's good for you. When you go for a walk, the first thing, or one of the first things that changes is your gut microbiome reads it and says, okay, I'm healthy, I'm getting out there for a walk quick. And it starts to kill off the bad ones and produce the good stuff for my body. Wow. It's a self-healing system right in there as long as you look after it. And if you don't, you end up with something called dysbiosis, where it's out of balance. And you've got one or two species that shouldn't be growing in large numbers, but it is. And as a result, and you've lost that biodiversity, you've, you've lost that thousand species. And the good ones are down here and the bad ones are up here, or the, the, what do I call the opportunistic ones are up here. And to get them back, we've got to refeed them. But these are all the conditions linked to dysbiosis. Leaky gut. Leaky gut. Alexander Metchenkov, that's the guy, the Russian zoologist I mentioned. Alexander Metchenkov knew this back in 1907. So what we need to do is relearn it all. All of these conditions are linked to a dysbiosis and a leaky gut. And we heal the aging gut. Now that I've convinced you, this is why, by the way, in my talks, they used to call me Dr. Doom. But I've got to give you the negative stuff so that you can say, OK, I understand it. And you understand this better than 95% of the medical staff out there. They don't go into this research. They just keep plodding along with what they're learning. So what we've got here is eat less processed foods. I see there's a, a bread van out there. Feed it to the ducks, please. <laughs> no, don't. No, don't. No, no, don't worry, I've got to come up with that. Don't, because it clogs them up. And you can't feed it to the animals in the zoo because it kills them. You go to a national park and says, please don't feed human food to the animals. It kills them. Hold on. If we're allowed to feed it to us? Oh, something's wrong with the system. There are more warnings, health eating warnings. And we've got, hold on, we've got a star system. Oh, you know, rate the foods, how good the foods are. You know, that five star system is so corrupt. You can find foods that get it to us. I've seen almonds with a four and potato chips with a four. Milo used to have a rating of five, I think, what, four and a half, until they got so much flack that they took it off. Milo is a junk food. It should be negative five. A nice treat, by the way, for kids. But you get the idea? The system is corrupt. So what do you eat? What your grandparents had. What your parents had. What we've eaten through history. That's the stuff we need to go back to. Get off all that processed breads. Please cut it out. Slower, smaller meals. Overnight fasting. 12, 12. For 12 hours at least. I prefer 16, 8. 16 hours of not eating. So I'll have my dinner. And then for about 14, 15, 16. Until I feel hungry. And then I'll have some incredibly nutritious food. Not pasty processed breads and cereals and, and things like that. I'll have real food. And then I'll eat for that six or seven hours or whatever it is. And then I won't. And it's simple. This morning I'm busy, so hey, I had a, 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 you know, a big nutritious snack before I come here. So we need, and you've all heard of this fasting craze, haven't you? If you're a fast for about 16 hours, that means just not eating for 16 hours. It starts, your body starts a process called autophagy. It starts to self-break down all of the old senescent cells. It starts to just get rid of them. So it's clearing up. It's like a big rubbish truck's going through the body and every old cell's going, here it is, here it is, check it out. And you've got all this rejuvenation. That's why everyone's talking about it. Are they overdoing the talking? Yes. But again, the only reason we eat between, you know, have breakfast, lunch, and dinner is called the Industrial Revolution. To fit it into a working day. And to fit it into a school day without kids or grandkids. And so we need more fibre, no doubt. One of the simplest things. And I've got a treat in the bag, ones where uh, my wife put in and said, look, in case you get hungry, have one of these. And it's 100% uh, of the ingredients are dates, cacao, and uh, cashew. Now it is slightly processed because it's all grown up and thing but it's still got the essential ingredients. And it's 12% fibre. Most of your foods are less than 1% fibre. Now fibre, as you'll see in a moment, is the greatest gut food. Not for cleaning, for feeding. And so we've got to eat more fibre. Then, eat some raw food. Who does a smoothie nowadays? 
40 years it wasn't here. You've got half a dozen or more people doing smoothies. Great. Get it. You know, I used to do a lot of smoothies on my, my YouTubes and videos and stuff like that. People say, what's the recipe? I'd say, what's in the fridge? What's current? You know, or what's in the freezer if I've run out of mango or something to put in there? Or if the bananas are going off, they go into the... Or I throw an apple in. Or at the moment, guess what's in my smoothies? Whole oranges. Eat the whole orange. Don't throw the peel. The peel is 10 times more nutritious than the orange. I throw the whole orange in from the back. Actually, it's from the tree of my mother-in-law. <laughs> so just get it. She give me a box for it. What am I going to do? So in it goes into the smoothie. Put some other bits and pieces in there. A bit of extra fiber. Beautiful taste. A bit tangy, but beautiful. <laughs> and then... Why that? Because it's rich in polyphenols and fibre. These are the two major gut foods. Now some people will say, have more probiotics. There's ads on television, if you've got this, have probiotics. Great, great. But if you're having probiotics and not feeding them, and feeding the change it creates, you're wasting your money. I want to save your money here. So what do you consume along with it? I consume polyphenols, and what are they? <laughs> See all these? Turmeric is a rich source. Curcumin is a polyphenol. There's one called resveratrol in grapes, also in red wine. There's the green tea ones are called epicatechins. Um, all of those, all of your herbs and spices, and your herbs and spices have 10 times more than your veggies. So I add them to everything. If I have a breakfast, I'll put some herbs and spices on it. My granddaughter at school was ridiculed last week because when they said, what do you have for breakfast? And she says, uh, um, avocado and curry powder. Wow. I brainwashed that one, not the other one. <laughs> Why? Try it. Don't criticize, try it. Like my wife would say, try it. And then when you've tried it three or four times, you'll start to like it. And if you don't, then try something else. But you've got to add more of this stuff in. <coughs> eat more Indian. Eat more Balinese. Eat more Indian. Eat more. These are the cultures that have all the spices. And they have the spices for a reason. And all of the cultures who live longer eat herbs and spices. And by the way, when it comes to herbs, I grow my oregano and my rosemary and thyme I just don't do well with for some reason. So I go and get some bulk thyme. And I put it in and... I've actually made up a, um, uh, my winter, this week I made up my winter throat, um, uh, what do I call it, a lozenger, well it's not, it's a liquid, but all it is, is garlic, which is rich in polyphenols, onion, cut them up, crush them a bit, put them in a little jar and fill it with good quality unprocessed honey. And that's for anyone in our family who gets a sore throat or just wants to smell like garlic. <laughs> How simple is that? And the cost of it? Well, the cost of a bit of honey, you know, two, three dollars for that jar, because, and another dollar for the garlic and so on. And it has great, and it's rich in polyphenols. It's got something in it called quercetin. And quercetin is one of the most powerful antioxidant polyphenols, anti-inflammatory polyphenols, and it's perfect for feeding the gut microbiome. Do you see how it all works? All those nutrients you're told about, they work first in the gut, then in you. And so that's what I do. And when you have polyphenols and fiber, it increases your biodiversity, which is what you want because that increases your health. And so we add fiber. Now, this is where I'll tell you I have a vested interest. I'm gonna promote a particular company called K-Fiber. Why? Because about five years ago, I discovered them, liked them so much, I bought shares in the company. But I, I own 0.1%. So if you buy a packet, I don't get anything. In other words, there's no significant benefit in me telling you to get it, except I use it every day, so do my kids, so do my parents-in-law, so does everyone in our family. Because it's the simplest combination of actually polyphenols, fibre and a few other things. And it's made from sugarcane. It comes from Queensland. Uh, and they are exporting it all around the world now. Has anyone here heard of it? Yeah. It probably hasn't got out to Gosnells. <laughs> it certainly is in Fremantle, the, end, the, the chiropractic at the end of my street, all these other places around. Um, at the end of the day, it is the simple and best, safest fibre. Do I like psyllium husks? They're okay, but only a little bit. 
Does this work? Yes, it does, because they do the experiments here in Australia with people with reflux and other conditions out there. So it's great. So then it comes to, what about probiotics? So the polyphenols and the fibre feed them, but then we want to speed it up, so we're going to introduce probiotics. And the two major probiotics that show up in all of the research for healthier ageing, there's some individual ones, but if I do that, it confuses me and everyone else. It's the bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. And they're the ones you'll get on the yogurt, the, the good, the good yogurt containers. Now, is yogurt any good? Hold on a minute, I'll tell you that in a moment. But we want more of the bifida, and you get them as a supplement. Oh, buy my supplement. It's got 13 different varieties in it. Unless they know especially what they're for, it's of no value. Just go for two or three. That's all you need. So you can then make a selection on how many is in there. And that's called CFU, Comedy Forming Units. The higher the amount, the better it is. So you can make a judgment. You can get them online, you can get them at you know, the warehouse with the chemist next to it. Or the chemist, <laughs> you, can get a, 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 you can get them at Woolworths, my favorite health food store is Woolworths. You, know, you can get it anywhere. And you can look for it, and should you be supplementing? Yeah, if you've got health conditions, more. If you want to rebuild your gut now and say, okay, I want to, and oh, I've been taking them for three days and I don't notice any difference. When you take them for three months, you might. This is a, a, a marathon. This is your life. It's not a sprint. So just start doing the stuff I'm telling you and build up. The best way to achieve optimal or improve your health. And does it work for everything? No, you know, I had, a, I had a very serious health condition last year. Put me in hospital. Didn't even understand, didn't even know it. Never heard of it before. But I got out and guess what I did straight away? I did the research on it. And then I wrote, so coming back to it. Can it work for you? Yes. Is it something I do every day? Yes. I have the fiber, I have the polyphenols, and I have the probiotics, high dose probiotics, every second day. Sometimes every first day, some, you know? And my message is everyone should be doing that. And what it does is it doesn't just increase bifido, it increases the whole biodiversity. Because when they get down there, they say, hey, while I'm here, I'm going to help you. And they help the other good species. And they poison the bad ones. And so you get all these other good ones growing around it. It's a win-win situation. Then you've got superfood. Probably cost you five cents a day, this one. And this, I'm not suggesting you buy Bragg. I suggest you go to Woolworths or Coles and get the organic one with the mother in it. And you take it. Now, if you've got <coughs> the LPR I mentioned, you don't take it. Because that will exacerbate it. And you'll know, because when you have it, you'll be doing <coughs> trying to clear your throat. However, if you've got reflux or any other condition, it's great for digestion. Beautiful for digestion. Marvellous. It's got probiotics, prebiotics, phytobiotics, phytonutrients. It's got acid in it to acidify your stomach. Brilliant. It's the perfect food for the stomach. Which is why Hippocrates and the people back 2,000 years ago talked about it. And it's why your parents knew about it. But we forgot to pass it on. Why? Who's going to make a profit out of a $4 bottle of organic apple cider that'll last you three months? How simple is that? How do you take it? A little bit mixed in with a bit more water. Always diluted. Always diluted. Then you say, okay, what's the next one? And these are oh, fermented foods. All the long-lived cultures in the world use vinegar, by the way, and fermented foods. The vinegar may not just be apple cider. It might be cherry plum vinegar or apple or whatever. They've, they've got, the, they can ferment. And they've got all these beautiful fermented foods that are used in all these cultures too. And what have we got? Yogurt. And we've only had that for the last 40 years. Yogurt's fantastic. But I add my probiotics to the yogurt. And I have some of these. I get a bottle of sauerkraut for five dollars and it lasts two months. And just a little bit on some of the foods here and there. And then we do a little bit more of this and we ferment some of the lemon and we do that. And we just add a little bit. It's not about going overboard, it's just adding a little bit into your... And that's a taste sensation. Helps with digestion, has heaps and heaps of benefits. 
And so then we've got what I call, consider the sodium bicarb miracle. Sodium bicarb, this one will cost you half a cent a day. And you get a little bit of sodium bicarb first thing in the morning. Now, again, I've done a YouTube on this to explain why. But the first thing it does is alkalizes all the way down, which is good. It gets to the stomach and it'll sneak through the acid a little bit. It'll get react. You'll know if it reacts because you'll start burping, but it'll sneak through. Now you never have it with a meal, so I tell people just a half a teaspoon, a quarter of a teaspoon, mixed in with some water, first thing in the morning before you wake up. So you wake up, stir and down it goes. Oh, can I have it with my medication? No, wait a half an hour. Because it alkalizes, it will alkalize if it goes in with anything else. And then it gets into the small intestine where that bloating is occurring, you know, the SIBO, and it starts to alkalize it. Wow. I wish I could get that to a half a million people around the world who are struggling with SIBO. Wow. And then it gets absorbed into your body and goes into your bicarbonate store to make sure your saliva and your stomach have enough sodium bicarbonate of your own. It's a win-win-win situation. It's so incredibly cheap. Should you take it if you're a vegetarian eating a perfect diet? Probably not. But if you're eating a Western food, yes, you should. And I'm going to recommend you all do a pH strip test. No, that's not strip. You know the pH tags you get? Yeah, put your saliva in it. Go to a chemist. No, go online. They're much cheaper. I found one chemist that charged me $30 and the same was $10 online. So I go to... $10, get them, spit in there, see what it is, and if it's around seven, you're perfect. If it's five or six, you need some sodium bicarb. Again, I explain a lot more. And so, simple way to do it, there we go. All these herbs and spices aren't just good for your reducing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and helping you with uh, heart attacks and strokes and inflammation, but they're also great for gut conditions. These are scientific studies that have demonstrated these herbs and, and spices and many, many, many more, I can put them up and you go, wow, I've never heard of them. There's another one called Nigella sapphia, black cumin. Anyone heard of that one? Or what's another name? You can get black cumin oil or cumin black seed oil or something like that. Brilliant, but that's not well known yet. But go into the shops and you'll find it being sold there now. So these are some of the ones that will work with reflux. So what else can I do? Walking. You don't need to go to the gym. People who go to the gym and build huge muscles don't live longer. The people who walk as much as they can on a day do live longer. Why? Because every time you go for a walk, it stimulates the gut microbiome to say, hey, it's going good. So it starts to push out the opportunistic ones and feed up the good commensal ones so your gut is getting better and healthier and healthier. It's a win-win situation. And then when you add walking and a bit of acupuncture works, nutritional strategies of course. Diaphragm breathing. You want a healthy gut? Do that. Why? Because everything down there is muscles and we forget to use it. You don't have to go and do, you know, um, crunches and... <laughs> Breathe! <laughs> Breathe! If you've got reflux, your diaphragm, what's called your lower esophageal sphincter, probably isn't working well. And that's just the stuff coming from the stomach up to here. So what do you do? Well, exercise the muscles. It's a muscle. Now, how do you exercise it? It's all connected to the di diaphragm. Wow. How simple is that? There's some really simple strategies for things like that. You know, with hypertension, I'll give you one. They gave people 500 mils of water and it reduced the hypertension by 10%. Only 10% of the population. Wow. Don't believe it's because it's simple. It doesn't work. The simplest there's something called Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is probably the best answer. Yoga exercises and sleep. All of these things combined. But what's great is when you do one, it changes the gut microbiome. And when you do another one, so diet, it changes it. And when you do exercise, it changes it in a different way. So when you do them together, you get a synergy. And your gut microbiome is saying, wow. You see, if you eat a crap diet and have... Um, uh, and you go walking a lot, it ameliorates the effect by, let's say, 50 or 60, 70%. Not because of the calories and weight, it alters the gut microbiome by that much, in a, you know, in a positive way, instead of hurting it. So the answer, the answer is simple. Combine them to get the real benefit. 
So looking after your gut isn't just probiotics, it's all of these things I've been mentioning up here. And then we get to the final question on everyone's lips. <laughs> I've had a stressful talk. <coughs> Can I have a wine? Because you've been told by the health professionals in the wine industry that wine's good for you. There is no evidence in the world to show wine's good for you. None whatsoever. Never has been. Oh, some, sp some sponsored industry wine research showed it. But when you look at the big studies, yeah, there might be a little benefit over here in reducing the risk of a heart attack or a stroke, but in the process, triples your risk of developing this, 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 and this. But red wine has something in it called resveratrol, a potent polyphenol, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. But you have to have 300 glasses of it to get a daily dose. <laughs> And in the talks away, you know, I've got a 20-year-old in the audience, he goes, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> 30 glasses are probably killing it, it's not going to work, is it? So it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But, by the way, if you want a glass of wine, have a glass of wine, enjoy it. Because I believe the benefit for me having a glass of wine today is after a busy week, I'm going to sit down with my best friend, happens to be my wife, and probably my daughter will be over, and we'll have a glass of wine and say, oh, the end of the week. By the way, my week starts every day anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. But I enjoy it. And, but I don't expect a health outcome from it. So have a glass of wine, have a glass of drink, because believe it or not, most long populations around the world have a glass. They just don't have five or six every night. And that's a very, very simple message. The final part of this is if you want more information, search it out. Search it out, please. Um, don't wait 20 or 30 years. Implement what I've given you, but also in addition, I've got my books here, I sell. That is my vested interest. Uh, I, I, I sell these all over the world, literally, and they're 10, 20 years ahead of what you will find out there. So please have a look at them. The blue book explains what I've said today and a lot more. And the other book there, uh, Gut Health, is, um, is really about a program to start repairing your gut if you've got gut issues. But we've got some other books out there as well. Have a look at them. Um, they're uh, available online, but um, uh, I prefer not to because I have to then send them out. It takes too much work for me. And then, finally, I'm also on social media, as I've already highlighted. I put all of my stuff up on my YouTube channel free. You don't pay for it. You get a few ads in there, but you go, you subscribe, and every time I put, and I'm trying to put up stuff every, probably two a week because I've got 40 years of accumulated information in there. And this, I've got a video where I put up, it was taken down on Facebook and a few other places, and it was called um, The Arthritis Gut Connection. So basically, when you start to do that, you're fixing the gut, okay? And to create arthritis in, in animals, to test them, they stop them producing collagen and or they poison the gut microbiome and the animals develop arthritis. So then they find a drug that can reverse that rather than stopping the problem in the beginning. So that's why collagen is so good. That's why probiotics, work. they've all been demonstrated. They've taken poo from mice who have arthritis, put it in healthy mice and they develop arthritis. They've taken the poo from the healthy mice and put them in the mice who have arthritis and it gets rid of the arthritis. They've done it in humans where they human poo from someone with arthritis in mice and it causes arthritis. Now, I'm not saying yes, poo swap, <laughs> okay? But you get the idea. The link is very, very strong. But whenever I put that up, it gets taken down, unfortunately, because it's a simple solution that's going to cost you, what, a dollar, uh, five cents a day, 10 cents a yeah, day? Yeah. And will it work for everybody? No. But if you add in a little bit of fibre and a few probiotics and a few other bits and pieces, 